For all of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Kate Leisinga. I'm one of the associates here at DBC. Thanks so much for coming tonight to our seminar. We do these every month, if you didn't know. So uh, keep an eye out. We're gonna talk about the next seminar that we're doing in July at the end. I'm pretty excited for that. I know Dr. Denbor is too. I'm gonna be presenting tonight, and so is our health coach, Dawn one of the two health coaches that we work with here at DBC. Really excited to hear what she has to say and to contribute because a lot of what we're gonna talk about tonight is what happens in that health coaching room, one-on-one uh, -on -one with patients. She does a lot of education with patients about, okay, so I have all these recommendations, I have all these limitations, what do I do? How do I live my real life? How do I navigate um, the grocery store? Right? And then today is going to be a little bit about that. We're going to kind of hit the high notes um, and hopefully, uh, as we said, decode food labels because um, really ignorance doesn't work with food labels. What you don't know about the food that you're eating can be harmful to you um, depending on how that's, how that's working out. And there are a lot of little hidden things in there. Um, we call them sneaky ingredients. So we're going to talk about those sneaky ingredients um, that can be can kind of uh, sabotage all of the hard work that you're doing. So we, we don't want that to happen. So we're gonna hopefully demystify some of that for you tonight. So we'll get started with that. Uh, I'll have a couple announcements, one major one. We're gonna discuss nutrition facts, and you'll see I put that in quotations, right? Facts are not facts. And what do they mean? It's nice to have facts, but if, if you don't have meaning to put to those, then it's not so helpful. Uh, Dawn's gonna discuss how to translate the ingredient lists that you see on the back of those, um, of the back of those food products, okay? Uh, and then we're gonna practice evaluating a couple different things um, and practicing what we just learned. And then we'll discuss next seminar. One announcement is remember Nature's Remedies newsletter sign up. If you haven't yet signed up for this, this is a good way to stay on top of what's going on in Nature's Remedies. Make sure you don't miss out on things like big sales. We just had a nice sale, so hopefully some of you guys got to take advantage of that. You would have, oops, you would have heard about that in uh, Nature's Remedies newsletter, so. A lot of people, when they talk to me about food, they say it's too confusing to read the food label. I look at it, I can't make heads or tails of it, why bother, I just kind of guess. Well, I don't advise that for a couple reasons. First of all, it's important to be an informed eater. That's what I like to cultivate at DBC. We want to have lots of informed eaters here, <coughs> meaning you know what you're doing, right? You know what it is you're eating. You know what's included in that. You, you don't know, oh, I'm eating bread, right? But we know what is that bread made out of, right? What are the main ingredients? What are some of the additives to that bread? What's included nutritionally in bread, right? What does that mean to eat a piece of bread? What is it doing to my body? So being an informed eater is partly why we want to discuss today reading food labels and knowing how to translate those so that you can be informed. It also helps us to avoid common pitfalls and what I call health sabotage, right? You think you're doing everything right, you're doing all these supplements, you're exercising, you're doing your best with your diet, but you're eating these foods that are health foods, right? but they may actually be sabotaging all of those efforts because you don't know what's in them. You don't know how to decode and read what, what you're working with. So making sure that we can avoid some of those pitfalls um, as well as figuring out what the, the, um, those sabotages are will help you make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to do. So that's why we wanna talk about that tonight. Obviously, there are some general rule of thumbs that really don't have anything to do with a food label. For instance, Eat foods without labels. <laughs> That's an easy way to know what you're eating, right? Uh, what are some foods that don't have labels that we can safely eat? Tomatoes. Tomatoes, wonderful. Asparagus. Good. So lots of veggies, right? If we're, getting, if we're shopping in the produce aisle for fruits and veggies, usually we're doing pretty well. So foods without labels, I mean, that's, that's a big part of it is those fruits and veggies. What else maybe doesn't have a label? Sure. What about meats? That would be a good one, right? If you know where your meat's coming from, locally raised, organically sourced, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, a, a high quality piece of meat shouldn't have additives to it, right? So that would be a food without a label. That could be a, a good one. It, similar to meat, what's another one? Another food that doesn't have a label? Fish. 
Fish, yeah, yeah. Eggs. Eggs, that's the one I'm thinking of, right? Really, really good source of healthy fats, lots of protein. So there's lots of options for us within that sphere of foods without labels. So if we can try to stick you know, to that as much as possible, you're already doing yourself a favor and you're making things less confusing. So at DBC, we talk a lot about that. We also talk about how if you're going to eat food with a label, try to keep the ingredient list as short as possible. Also, keep it as pronounceable as possible. <laughs> Right? So if there's, if there's items on there that you can't pronounce or look like a chemical formula, probably not whole real food, right? Not what we really want to be focusing on as, as far as uh, ingredients go. So if you can't pronounce it, be cautious. Always an informed decision is a better decision. Okay, like we talked about cultivating that, that culture of informed eaters, right? So uh, generally, even if you know, hey, you know, this has something in there or it has too many ingredients, you can at least choose between good, better, and best, right? If you find yourself in a scenario, we're going to talk about this a lot later, sometimes for either convenience or you find yourself in a scenario where it's, it's almost unavoidable to eat uh, a processed food item, how do you choose between the bottom of the barrel and something that might be more on the top end, right? That would be okay to do every once in a while. Even if you're trying to keep, you know, 80% of your foods label free for the rest of that time, how do I choose the best option, right? Even if it is the best of the worst, how do I choose that or how do I ration myself that way? So that's why I say it's always good to be able to be informed because you can make a better decision even if it's not always the best decision. Make sense? Yeah, because we all know, right? A lot of this stuff is unavoidable in life and we just want to minimize and we want to know what we're putting into our bodies. Food claims are different than food facts. Okay, there are certain things that are claimed on the box of a food or on the jar or on the can um, that really don't have anything to do with what's actually in the food, right? So here's some different ones. 100% natural. What does that mean? <laughs> it's hard to say, right? Is there anyone that's the 100% natural police? There's probably guidelines on there and standards that you have to meet and all of that kind of stuff. But 100% natural does not mean 100% healthy for us or good for us, right? So a lot of people are tricked by these kind of labels. 100% natural, no high fructose corn syrup. That's great, okay? But does that say anything about the total sugar content of what you're eating? No, there's lots of different ways that you can inj inject sugar into an item and it might make it unhealthy for you or not the best choice, right? Even if it's not totally unhealthy. <coughs> Fat free, okay? Those of us who have been around DBC know this isn't something that we really want to see on our food. Fat free because fat's good for us, right? The certain kinds of fats we really want in our diet. As well as when you make an item fat free, you have to replace the fat with something and it's usually not whole real food that they're replacing it with, okay? So sometimes it's better to avoid things that are fat free. It's tricky, right? It makes you think, yes, this is good for me. It's fat free, it's 100% natural. It's made with organic wheat, but it has 50 grams of sugar in it. <laughs> so you, you really have to be careful with uh, buying into these food claims, especially when it comes to things marketed as health foods. We all know that uh, marketing towards health foods is huge right now, right? Foods that are obviously not healthy are trying to become part of a balanced diet, right? Breakfast foods, cocoa puffs, right? Things, things that obviously have way too much sugar are, let's see, heart healthy, right? Because they have some fiber in it. So any, any claim that a company can make that their food is healthy or healthier, they're going to stamp that on the box. We have to figure out which of these claims are real, and are helpful for us and help us distinguish which food is the better choice and which ones are just false and we can ignore them. Okay? That's why we are gonna focus tonight on food facts and ingredients because I can't possibly come up with all of the fancy ways that people have to market their food as healthy and help you figure out which is real or not. 
Instead, we're going to look at the standards on the side of the box, the black and white, and we're going to see if we can figure it out that way instead. Sound good? There are some food safety concerns as well. Certain items that are added to foods that we research is showing to be quite unsafe for us actually. Now obviously the food industry and the legislation has not caught up with the most recent research, but they're starting to. So for things like aspartame, MSG, high fructose corn syrup, we're starting to realize that these things are really, really not good for us and they can make us very sick. And so um, we will be able to see in some of these healthy foods that those still might be a part of it and so we can ignore them. GMO, we're going to get to that. We're going to talk about that, okay, briefly. But it's, it has to do with changing the genetics of foods, okay, um, and adding different genetic codes to foods to make them maybe pesticide resistant or easier to grow in less water or that kind of thing. So um, it's a hot topic right now and, and we'll definitely be touching on that a little bit later, okay, so good question. We all know the difference between a food claim and a food fact, right? We're good with that, comfortable with that. So we're gonna focus on the facts. So I'm gonna take us through nutrition facts here on the top, okay? And, and usually underneath this, you'll see the whole ingredient list. Dawn's gonna talk to you a little bit about that, okay? So we're gonna talk about, I hit a couple of the high notes, the ones that I think are important to talk about, and then we'll, um, we'll look at some examples. Okay, so first thing that we always want to look at is serving size. Unfortunately, a lot of people skip right down to calories. Okay, so they skip over this lovely little serving size thing here, and they skip down to calories and they say, oh, hmm, 160 calories, that's not so bad. You know, I can, you know, this is a good snack for me, 160 calories. But they forget that, oh shoot, there's actually six servings in this container and I just ate the whole thing. Oh. <laughs> Wait a second. You want to know what a serving size is for peanut butter? I'm going to talk to you about that later. I guarantee you it's less than you put on your toast, right? Okay? So when you think you're getting one thing, but you're actually getting six times that thing, problematic, right? So whenever we look at a, at a food nutrition fact label, we need to make sure we start right up here. What is my serving size? And it will help you figure out, okay, what... How, where do I go from here? It puts everything in context. All the rest of this depends on the serving size. Okay, make sense, right? And if you start looking at this, you will be surprised at how many serving sizes are in things that seem to be one serving. Does that make sense? So, uh, like a can of something, right? A can of something that you or I could easily eat for lunch actually turns out to be maybe two or three servings. Right, so keep an eye on that. Take a look at that with some of the foods that you currently use or eat, and I think you'll be surprised to find exactly what's, what's the serving size, yeah? Calories, okay. Calories are tricky. Here's why. Calories are not everything when it comes to food. A calorie of pizza is not the same as a calorie of broccoli. It's not the same. We like to reduce that. Okay? In, in, in the larger medical nutrition community, we try to reduce everything down to calories. Heard calorie counting, Weight Watchers is based on calories, right? A calorie in is a calorie out. Not true, science does not support that. Our bodies process calories differently depending on what they are. Makes sense, right? So when we look at calories, are they important? medium because you can still eat too many calories of healthy foods for your body right so we still have to modify how many calories we're taking in and that is different depending on who you are on what you're doing for treatment okay I, I know a ton of people who are trying to lose weight by cutting calories and they're actually gaining weight by eating fewer calories because it's of, of their metabolism, very, very true. And the hormones, right, that are connected with that, and the adrenal system, and cortisol, very complicated stuff, okay? So making sure that you're looking at calories, but not using it as the end-all, be-all, right, is, is where we want to land, okay? 
So when we look at calories, we do want to check and see. And if you're curious, hey, how many calories should I be eating? Maybe you should talk to a DBC doctor or um, talk to one of the health coaches because if we, if we run a BIA on you, sometimes that can give us a ballpark of where we want to look. Um, but it, it isn't one of those things that I can say, you and you should probably eat the same calories, right? Because you're a woman and you're this age. That's not how it works, right? It's much more complicated than that. So looking at calories, very much an individual thing, but I think you understand some general, right? It's not the end-all be-all, but we do want to keep an eye on it when we're looking at total calories. Fats, I mentioned before that fat-free doesn't mean healthy, right? A lot of people get really hung up on fat. I can tell you a lot of very healthy foods have high fat percent, but the fats are healthy fats, right? Like from olive oil or, you know, eggs are gonna have a very high fat percentage to them. Av yeah, avocados, right? Anything with coconut oil in it. Even some uh, nuts and seeds, right? They're gonna have a lot of healthy fats. And so this is gonna be high and it's gonna scare people away. It shouldn't, okay? We do wanna watch the fats, but it's, that's one of the things that we look at more in the ingredients list. What type of fat am I dealing with here, right? We definitely wanna stay away from trans fats, right? We've, that's fat that's been basically made in a, in a chemical company, right? We don't really want that in our food. And you'll notice that a lot of foods are veering away from trans fats because of the research that's come out about how unhealthy they are for us. But total fat, that's a little bit more up to what kind of fat is in the food. We have some people in, at DBC, some of my patients, and I know Dr. Dembor does, that we're really pushing the fats, right? We really need a lot of extra fat in their diet because they need it for their nerves, right? Nerves are made up of fat. Or they need it for their hormones, which are also made up of fat, and they're not getting enough of that in their diet, of the healthy fats, right? So looking at fats that way is helpful. You will notice that by fat, you have percent daily value. Okay, percent daily, da daily value are based on a 2,000 calorie diet. Okay, so that might be higher or lower. So know that when you're looking at that, right, 2,000 calorie diet. Gives you a ballpark, can be very helpful, okay, to kind of get you an idea of where you're at with some of these things. If that number is really high, mm, you might want to reconsider it, especially if it's a small item like a snack. How much percent of my daily value do I want of uh, fat or sodium, right? Sodium's next on the list. A lot of our foods have an added sodium or are very salty. Mostly because back in the day, we used salt as a preservative. And so we started to get used to eating very salty foods. That was the flavor thing, right? That was how we were used to eating things. And so now, you know, our, you know, our taste buds, our collective taste buds are used to all of this salt and it's way, way more than our bodies need. You had a question? What's wrong with salt? Nothing's wrong with salt. Nothing's wrong with really any of these things on here. It's just how much salt you're getting in your diet. And since processed food has a lot of additional salt in it, we tend to get a little bit more than we need if we're eating a lot of processed foods. As a seasoning, it's great, no big deal. As a preservative, it still works, but you just have to limit. Salt gets a low sodium diets are super popular for what? What chronic disease? High blood pressure, right? Low sodium diet, you hear a lot of people doing that. Unfortunately, they're not modifying other things in their diet. So it's really hard to do just a low sodium diet and bring your blood pressure down, but it could be a step in the right direction, at least from reducing some processed foods. So that's sodium. Fiber, what is fiber for? Say it again. Elimination. Elimination and digestion, right? It's the scrub brush of our intestines, okay? We need a lot of fiber. What else does fiber do? Does anybody know what, what loves fiber? What the happy things in our intestines really like fiber? Hairs. What? Hairs. The, the digestive hairs in there, yep, yep. That's the scrubbing them out for sure. But how, how about the little living things? Yeah. Yeah, right? Bacteria, healthy, happy bugs that live in our gut that we want to flourish. They really like fiber. Fiber is good for them. Okay, so if we eat a really low fiber diet, we get very slow digestion 
and we get unhappy gut bacteria, which leads to, calories, say it again? You retain calories. Every fiber loses seven calories a day. Yeah, fiber and, you know, other molecules of calories, right, if it moves through together, that's why pizza and broccoli aren't digested the same and don't end up in your bloodstream the same way, because of the fiber content, right? So how your body processes a low fiber food is very different than how your body processes a high fiber food in, in, in terms of how quickly it raises your blood sugar. And that's really what we're looking at as opposed to calories, right? How, how many blood sugar spikes am I getting? That's where we start to have problems. Okay, it's really about blood sugar. So fiber, right? We want to look for that. We would love to have lots of fiber in our foods. Now, really easy way to get lots of fiber is to eat foods without food labels. Yeah. Right? Fruits and veggies. That's where we get all of our lovely fiber. Okay? So other sources of fiber besides fruits and veggies? Anybody have any ideas? Oatmeal, grains, some, some very low processed, right? The less processed the grain is, the more fiber usually retains. So de depending on what type of grain, right? We can get some fiber from quinoa has, has good fiber in it, okay? Um, yeah, so some grains can have that kind of stuff in it. Uh, any other sources of fiber you guys can think of? About beans. Beans, yep, yep, legumes are great. Nuts and seeds, right? Sometimes have good fiber in there. So good sources of fiber. You don't have to eat fiber one bars to get that. You don't have to drink a crazy drink, you know, that tastes like chalk to get fiber. We prefer nice whole natural fibers to do that. But fiber is important. I'm going to pick on this guy a little bit. No shock to anyone, I'm sure, right? Sugar. Now we talk, we're going to talk a little bit about sources of sugar, Dawn is, okay. but one thing I really want to point out to you here is, do you see what's missing on this food label for sugar? What's missing that the other items have? Percent daily value. Huh. That's interesting, isn't it? Why do you think that is? Why do you think that they don't put percent daily value on sugar? Because it has no nutritional value. It has no nutritional value, right? And it would far, far exceed your percent daily value. Just about any processed food is going to far, I mean, it's going to be more than you should take in in a day. So they don't want to put that on there because you're going to see it and you're going to go, 250% oh, of my daily value of sugar? Um, no, thank you, right? So they just leave it off. There was actually legislation that allowed them to leave that off for that reason. Yeah? Is it true that there's so many different forms of sugar in something that they could never qualify or break down all of that? No, you can know how much sugar is in there. Okay. It's just a matter of, you know, they don't want to say how much sugar you should have, basically. I'm going to say that in a second. Yeah? Is any one sugar better than that? Yes, ish, right? Uh, but you can do, you can definitely overdo it with honey, right? You can overdo it with maple sugar, maple syrup. Sorry, you know, I mean that that's, and and a lot of times people still do, right? I mean that's a big problem. Yeah, I'm sugar free, right? Processed sugar, not anything in my diet. Well, carbs are still sugar. Yeah. So rice is basically sugar. It that's what it turns into, right? White rice. A lot of people think that's a very healthy alternative. So, lot, yes, there are a lot of sources of sugar, but it's definitely something that we have to watch. Okay, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second. We'll look at some sources of sugar. Um, and then protein. Protein is another one people will look at. We do like to have foods high in protein. Um, again, you're not going to see a daily value for protein. Okay, that's one of those things that's very different depending on who you are, how much protein you need, but higher is better on this one. And if you can balance out sugars and proteins, that's usually a better thing too. So if something has a good amount of protein per sugar, usually going to be better, a better choice, right, because of that balance in there. Everything's going to have some sugars in it for the most part, but protein, sometimes you'll find very little um, within a, a healthy food. And so you want to try to stick towards the foods that have a little bit more protein in them too. So sugar, okay. Let's talk a little bit about what, what that looks like. 
um, how much sugar we're talking in some very popular food items. So here's our Skippy, right? Let's look at this top part here. Here's our Skippy label. Reduce fat. Healthy, right? Good stuff. Good, healthy. Total fats, 12 grams, okay? 18, oops, what did I do? I broke my own rule because I got so excited that it was reduced fat. Reduced fat, let's see how much fat's in there. But I skipped the serving size. I didn't even look at it, right? So serving size, two tablespoons. It's not very much peanut butter, right? How many servings per container? About 13. When I was a kid, I used to take a uh, spoon from the table and I used to scoop out peanut butter and just eat it like a lollipop, okay? That was easily, right? I would go through a half a thing of peanut butter. I mean, that was a healthy snack in my house, right? Peanut butter is good for kids, yeah? But look how much sugar I was getting. Four grams of sugar and two tablespoons of peanut butter. Now, peanut butter has lots of protein, so it balances out some of that, right? It does have fat in it, but you will see when we look at this a little bit later that the sourcing of fat in Skippy peanut butter might not be the best choice, okay? So you'll notice that. So we had serving size, we looked at that, calories, 180. Significant source of that is from fat. So we have to decide, do we like peanuts as a source of fat for us? Maybe, maybe better than some other sources of fat, right? Maybe not the best choice. And that's something you kind of have to weigh a little bit, right? How much peanut butter am I eating in a day? How much of my diet is comprised of Skippy reduced fat cream peanut butter? How much should it be? So that's all the questions that you can ask yourself when you look at the food label, right? And make those calls. We looked at fat. We noticed no trans fat, that's great. Sodium. 170 milligrams, it's not awful, 7%, right? Total carbs, you can see there's some fiber in there, right? Two grams of fiber for four grams of sugar. Not bad, not bad. And then your lovely protein here at seven grams. This stuff, kind of negligible, folks. You'll put, you'll put vitamins on there, but that's not gonna make, that's not gonna cut it for vitamins. You can't eat Skippy peanut butter as a source of calcium, well, because it's zero percent. But um, copper, zinc, zinc, come on. You're not, gonna get, you're not gonna get enough. If you have a cold, don't start eating Skippy peanut butter, right? It's not a good source of zinc. <laughs> These guys I kind of ignore, to be perfectly honest with you. Go eat an orange, right? So you can see kind of how we go through and evaluate this. So sugar, what's the deal with that? How much is too much? Our ancestors ate 22 teaspoons or 88 grams of sugar per year. Now, it's 150 to 180 pounds of sugar per year, okay? You can see that math doesn't quite, it's not good, right? Is that per person? Correct. It's a lot of sugar. Yep, we've added it to a lot of things. Not by our choice either. Well, I mean, it, it's a consumer market, right? So that's part of what's being, that's, that's what's being uh, an informed eater means, right? If you can, you know, vote with your fork, right? Choose foods that you know don't have this added sugar in it, right? You can drive the market that direction. I mean, that's the way that these things change, right? Demand. So if you have demand for foods with less sugar in them, hopefully the, the provision of those things will go up. World Health Organization, okay? This is a, a huge, 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 huge uh, organization making recommendations that a lot of different places follow, okay? They're actually dropping sugar in intake recommendations from 10% to 5%. That works out to be about 25 grams of sugar per day. Now I will tell you, this is too much. Our ancestors were eating 88 grams per year. 25 grams per day is still too much. Okay, so that's, that's, that's more than we recommend here at DVC. 
But, I mean, look, the World Health Organization's even saying this. 25 grams, and that comes quick, okay? For instance, you've got a, a 20 fluid ounces here of Coke. You notice a serving size here is one bottle, okay? So you can see straight up what the math is. Sugars, 65 grams in this puppy, okay? Now you guys probably don't drink Coke, right? You're like, Dr. Kate, I don't drink that stuff. Come on, let's be reasonable. Well, how about a, a healthy alternative? Honest tea, right? Mm -hmm. Very much marketed as a healthy alternative to sodas, okay? Sugar's still 25 grams in a bottle. But it contains 7% juice. <laughs> okay, so, right? We're still looking at these labels, right? It's still 25 grams. According to who, World Health Organization, this is it for you. That's what you get for sugar in the day. That's your daily allotment, right? Make sense? So let's say you're like, no, I'm just gonna go all natural, right? I'm not gonna do any added sugar, right? I know that tea doesn't normally have sugar in it, so they're adding it to this. So I'm just gonna drink orange juice. 100% orange juice, okay? Full day supply of vitamin C. Good things about this. But then you notice eight fluid ounces is the serving size. How big is eight fluid ounces? Somebody, mm, right, a little juice cup. Eight fluid ounces. Eight fluid ounces still has 23 grams of sugar. This like mortally wounded my mother when I told her about this because she drinks orange juice every morning and she realized, oh no, I am starting my day off with a sugar bomb in a cup, right? No wonder I have a crash at, you know, 10 o'clock. And my students are like, we need help here. And she's dragging because she's got this, you know, tanking from this orange juice, this, you know, big sugar bomb that she drank. So this is added sugar or is nope. sugar that comes from the orange itself? Sugar that comes from the orange. So even if you have an orange and you spread it right out, you'll have sugar. Yeah, and, and there's, I mean, the thing is, is oranges are, are a good choice, right? They're a better choice than a lot of things. But when you make juice, one of the things that you do is you take away a lot of the fiber that you would normally be getting from an orange. And we talked a second ago about how fiber helps slow down the release of sugar into your blood, right? Which gives you these sugar spikes. So if you're eating an orange or drinking an orange juice, it's, your body processes it a little bit different. Okay, so juicing sometimes, you gotta watch out for creating something that has a lot of sugar. Unless you're using you, you know, food items like, like greens and that kind of thing if you're juicing that. But most people do add you know, oranges and apples and berries and beets and that kind of stuff. And that can make you a, a sort of a sugary drink if you're not careful really quickly. So a little perspective on sugar really is all I was trying to show you guys. Question? What grams do you guys suggest of sugar per day? Again, pretty individualistic. I will say it's less than 25. So if you can get it lower than that, you're doing pretty good. Right? I would love to see that for people getting less than that. Questions on sugar, so on any you, of this stuff? Yeah. So if you need vitamin C and you want to cut down the orange juice, yep. what else is there that doesn't have? Well, I would just tell you to eat the orange. You know what I mean? Instead. Or, or get a, you know, a darker, a less tropical, yeah, uh, spinach, right? I mean, the, these kind of things that, that have vitamin C in it still that doesn't have a lot of the sugar um, that, that something like orange juice would have. Yeah? And again, is orange juice bad? Uh -uh. Is it the better choice? <laughs> right? Right? So that's really what we're looking at here. I'm not condemning any of these items except the Coke. <laughs> but I, I, I'll condemn that. But, right, we're just looking at, we're looking at perspective here. And, and you can gain that when you know how to read the nutrition facts. And you, and you have a little bit of an idea behind that. Because for sugar, they don't want to tell you that that's how much of a percent of your day that is. You know, instead of you doing the whole eight ounces, you could do half of that 
and then cut the sugar in half. I know a lot of so parents that do that with their kiddos. Yeah, yep, they'll like the water that. it down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. But you still, I mean, you may have the orange juice in the house or you may not have oranges or you might have oranges and you might just want to do this quick because you've got to leave. Sure. So and I would say that. that would be an informed choice, right? Yeah. As long as you know. Right. That's what I'm saying. You just yeah. And you can modify your behaviors if mm -hmm. you know. But I don't think, I think a lot of us just go for it, right? Thinking that that's a healthy choice and it might not be. So that's the point that I'm trying to make. My grandson had diarrhea up to age three. And I took him in because I was his babysitter. Mm -hmm. I went to the doctor and I said, there's physical. I said, what's going on? She said, how much juice is he drinking? I said, the water is juice. It's half and half. How much is he drinking? And I said, well, I don't know, maybe four, eight ounce glasses or something like that. Once they cut out the juice, he was solid. He was potty training. Mm -hmm. But it was pure diarrhea. And it was because, what, I forget what she called it, the, the term that Kids sure. Eat far too much sugar, even though it's half water and half juice. Well, and I think kids bear the 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 brunt of this sugar burden actually, because foods are tried. They, they, we try to make foods palatable for kids, right? And so to do that, we we add sugar to make kids want to eat it, you know. And then, and then that's part of the issue. Yes. Um, back on the label thing. Yeah. On all the you know. Mm -hmm. What exactly does that mean? It's a great question. There's no way to know until you look at the ingredients list. And we'll get there. We'll get there. Hold up for me. And if this is a daily dosage of sugar, how, what's eating a candy bar doing? Yeah, you, well, you know what? After this lecture, you're going to be able to check that out for yourself. Mm -hmm. Right? Now that you know, you can look at that and make your decision. So with, for, without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Dawn and she's going to talk a little bit about ingredients and then we'll have a chance to regroup and talk and analyze some, some other foods for us. Take it away, Dawn. All right. So that in, the ingredient list is what's going to come after that nutrition facts, that breakdown. Then usually right underneath there it will list um, what the ingredients are, those things that have gone into whatever food product you're eating. So that's where we find it. When you look at that ingredient list, it's broken down from what has the, the greatest amount of weight ingredient to the lowest. So your first ingredient is going to be the most prominent ingredient in there in terms of weight. So that's just good to know, right? When you're looking at it and trying to break it down and make that informed decision, you can kind of look and, and weigh that out. A Couple of things here that I really want you to know. Um, there are some ingredients that have these sort of generic names and they're not really well regulated to know what they are. So it might be something like natural flavors or spices and we're going to get a little more specifically when we look at some labels what that might be but it's just a very generic term that can mean lots of different things. Um, the other thing to be aware of is that some ingredients and especially sugar is known for this to be given several different names in an ingredient list so they can kind of sort of you know spook you out into how many how much sugar is really in there so we're going to go back to the skippy peanut butter and um, you can kind of look here this is where those nutrition facts are then here at the bottom is where that ingredient list is and we've kind of blown that up over here for you to look at so when I think about peanut butter what should be my main ingredient in peanut butter <laughs> Yes, and when I look at this list, what is the first ingredient? Peanuts. Peanuts. Yay, right? So, so far, so good. Let's look at that second ingredient after peanuts. Corn syrup solids. Okay, so we've talked about high fructose corn syrup and um, the understanding that we know that that is not something healthy for us to have. And then we look at that third ingredient. Sugar. Sugar. So my top three ingredients, of those top three ingredients in my Skippy peanut butter, two of them are sources of sugar. Hmm. Makes me start to think. As we look down a little bit further, um, we look at those fats that are in there. So we look at hydrogenated vegetable oils. So these are oils that have that hydrogen 
Adam added to it um, known to be not healthy oils for us to have. So when we're talking about taking in fats and wanting to get those fats in, this is not one of those healthy fats that we want to take in. We go further down here, then there is that list of some different minerals and vitamins that are put in, and Dr. K kind of hit some of that, that those are really negligible. Um, a lot of times when these things are added into our foods as well, they're not well absorbed, so definitely can't be considered a source of healthiness for us when, when we're eating those. So rules of thumb to follow when we're looking at those ingredient lists and we're going through them, and I'm gonna repeat a couple of the things that Dr. Kate said, just because they are so important. Eat whole real food, things that aren't in packages, um, things that are, are whole and real and natural. Um, I like the five or less rule, right? When we're looking at an ingredient list, look for things that have five ingredients or less. Kind of a good rule of thumb there to follow. And again, if you're not able to pronounce it, I really don't want you to eat it. I want you to know what it is. When in doubt, avoid. So this is where we kind of fall into some of those ingredients that we're not exactly sure what they are. So if you're on an elimination diet, or if you have a sensitivity to something like gluten or dairy or MSG, things like that, um, if you don't know what a certain thing is, uh, my recommendation is, is that we avoid it and find an alternative. You can look for allergens just below the ingredient list. So you have the nutrition facts, the ingredient list, and then often below that in capital letters, it'll be written, contains, and they're required to list the top allergens. So wheat, um, soy, eggs, peanuts, dairy, and it will list that in big letters. So I know when I'm in a hurry and I'm quick looking at my label, sometimes I'll look at that very bottom first because I can rule it out really quickly whether or not that's something I want to investigate further up into the um, ingredient list. Make sense? I'll show you an example of that later on. Um, don't panic, right? This is a process of learning, looking, it takes time. Um, and if we get all jacked up and anxious about it when we're in the grocery store and looking for things, um, that's really counterproductive for our health as well. So we do the best we can with what we have and, and we go from there. And know that the DBC health coaches are always here to help you. I cannot tell you how many times I have patients come into the room and they pull out of their pocket or they pull out of their purse or they bring in a whole grocery bag full of packages for us to look at. And I welcome that, right? Because we can learn and we can look through that together. So please utilize that resource as you need. So we're gonna start looking at some specific ingredients that we want to be aware of. So I'm gonna start with artificial sweeteners and, and colors, and I'm gonna pick on another beverage item here, um, the Crystallite, because this is one that I hear a lot from patients. Oh, well, I've given up the soda, I'm drinking Crystallite instead. <laughs> Yay, I'm glad you gave up the soda, that's good. But let's look at this Crystallite um, that so many people think are maybe a, a better option for us. I'm gonna hit here um, artificial sweeteners, aspartame. Sucralose is another one that we want to be looking for. Um, the other artificial sweetener that's in here is this one here, asulfame potassium. Sometimes you'll see that written as asulfame K. K is the chemical letter for potassium, so that's why they sometimes write it that, that way. Both of those are artificial sweeteners that we want to be aware of um, and know that they're not healthy for us. Neurotoxic. Question? Aspartame is, that's our NutraSweet, right? An equal. Mm. Mm -hmm. I know that, but what is it? It's a chemical sweetener. So it's literally made up of chemicals? Correct. Not natural? Oh. Correct. Correct. So when we think about that, would we want to put something that's chemical, not natural, in our body? Other ingredients in here that I want to call attention to are this natural and artificial flavor. Again, these are ones that we do not know what they are. And in the big picture, artificial flavor, do we really want to put that in, just like the artificial sweeteners? Then we go a little further down the line here and we see artificial colors, right? Which we know excite the nervous system. Um, and then it lists red 40 and blue one. So those are specific um, artificial colors that are in there. Definitely things that we want to avoid. So not only will you find these in things like Crystal Light, but things like your sugar-free jellos, sugar-free jams and jellies, 
gum. Those are all places to start looking for some of these ingredients. And um, so a little personal story, a couple weeks ago we were taking a road trip and we're going to be making some wraps while we're on the road to, to have to eat. And I wanted to take some dill pickles. So I'm in the grocery store looking at a whole rack of dill pickles and I was hard pressed to find any dill pickles that did not have yellow food coloring in them. I was disgusted and frustrated. I did ultimately find a six dollar jar of dill pickles that did not have food coloring in. Um, but it was a frustrating process. So, so a lot of times it's in those foods that we wouldn't think would have artificial colors in them. So be aware of those. So sneaky ingredients. So when we're talking about things like gluten, dairy, or casein, the protein in dairy, MSG, sugar. So there's obvious places we can find them. Um, most of you probably know what some of those obvious places are. I've highlighted just a couple of some of those more subtle or ones that, that maybe we wouldn't think of ingredients. The list is huge and exhaustive. So if you're interested in learning more about that, there is a lot of great resources on the internet. Again, the DBC Health Coaches can help you with that as well, this long list of potential ingredients that could be gluten, dairy, MSG, um, or sugar. But a couple that I wanna highlight, sources for gluten. If you see hydrolyzed plant protein or hydrolyzed vegetable protein, those can be potential sources of gluten. The word starch or modified food starch, things like that can be sources of gluten. The word seasoning or flavoring, again, those fall into kind of those generic terms that companies can put on their label. Um, they can indeed mean gluten. Seasonings would be gluten? Pardon me? What are seasonings? seasonings? Well, we don't know. When it says that on an ingredient list, we don't know what that seasoning is, and it could contain gluten. I recently looked at the back of yellow mustard. It had natural either seasonings or flavoring. Mm -hmm. We have to question. We don't know what that is. But what could they put in mustard? Good question. <laughs> Good question. Things we want to think about. Things I want you to be curious about. Sources of dairy or casein. So here at DBC we talk about casein, the protein in dairy that is known to be inflammatory. So different um, names where you might find that would be whey. Anything that's caseinate, you might see calcium caseinate, magnesium caseinate, potassium caseinate. Milk solids, that would be another source of, of casein or dairy that we're looking at. And anything that says lact, so lactose, lactalbumin, things like that. Um, sometimes patients will think that, well, I'm doing lactose-free dairy, I'm okay. Know that there's a difference there. Lactose is the sugar in dairy. Casein is the protein that's inflammatory. And so if you're consuming lactose-free dairy products, you're still getting that casein. MSG, different names for that. Yeast extract, bouillon, spice, natural flavoring, enzymes. Those are all different things that can mean MSG. Sources of sugar. So anything with an os suffix to it, sucrose, dextrose, glucose, things like that, cane juice, syrups. Um, sugar is one that will be listed in multiple different names and um, Dr. Kate and I later as we decode a label will we'll show you um, a label that has sugar listed in many different ways. Question I get a lot is what about organic? So um, organic is ideal when we can do that. Sometimes we don't have access to things that are organic. Sometimes it's cost prohibitive. So we have to then make choices in that good, better, best scenario. So some of my recommendations would be if you're using animal products, so any kind of meats or eggs, those are things that you would want to choose organic, grass-fed, wild-caught. Um, soy, corn, any of those two things as well, choose organic there. When we're talking about produce, um, a great resource is the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. Anybody familiar with those, heard of those before? You can find that at ewg.org. There's also many other places where you can find that list. So the Dirty Dozen is a list of the top 12 pesticide-laden produce items. Clean 15 
is the top 15 least pesticide laden produce items. So if you're having to go to the grocery store and decide which things am I going to get organic, which things not, this is a great resource to help you make that decision. Canned goods. If you're purchasing canned goods, organic is ideal with that as well. Canned goods that are not organic, and you can look at home, they will be lined with plastic. A source of BPA, bisphenol A, which is a known endocrine disruptor. So if you're going to choose canned goods, organic is the best choice. With your produce, there will be a barcode. There will be three different options that you might find. If your barcode has four numbers, then that item has been conventionally grown, but it's not organic. So again, if it has four numbers, it's been conventionally grown, but not organic. Conventionally grown would mean it's not genetically modified, but it's not organic, so it still could have pesticides. If the barcode has five numbers, begins with a nine, then that produce item is organic. So if it has five numbers, beginning with a nine, it's organic. And then if it has five numbers beginning with an eight, it's a genetically modified organism. So I'll just say that one more time. Four numbers means conventionally grown, not organic. Five numbers beginning with a nine means organic. Five numbers beginning with an eight means genetically modified. Yes? Is that consistent across like all grocery stores? Or wherever I go, it'll, it'll be five and eight? It is. It is. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is. If it's organic, it's not genetically modified. So you can know that as well. Yes? <coughs> It will have just the one part of it that's separated that will have either four or five. It's usually right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kate. She's going to talk a little bit about um, GMO. Yeah, so we've said GMO, we've talked about genetic modification, and right, hot button issue, big time. A lot of people talking about it right now across the world. Should we have GMOs? What, what is the harm in GMOs? What is the pluses of GMOs? Right? There's a lot of talk. So GMO stands for Genetically Modified Organism, GMO. So we've taken an organism and we've modified it by putting in different genetics or manipulating the genetics of that organism. Problem is we don't know really what that does once we ingest it, right? We change the genetics of something, we're not really sure what that does. Um, I can tell you that pretty much the rest of the world is not super keen on GMOs. This graphic is hard to see, but I can decipher for you. This is a yellow, supposed to be a yellow color. You will see that the United States and Canada do not require labeling of genetically engineered foods. These are the yellow dots. The rest of them are green. Mexico. Correct. In 50 countries, there are significant restrictions or outright bans on GMOs. Okay, Saudi Arabia, Japan, China. Is it just me or does the U.S. and Canada eat the most unhealthy? Uh, that is a, a very broad generalization that I don't think we can make. But I will say, what do these folks know that we don't? And or why are we the only people who don't label these GMOs. Okay, why don't we do that? I have a lot of questions about that, right? But I, I'm one of those people that, hey, you know, if, if these guys feel like there might be a problem with GMOs enough that maybe, you know, they're taking steps to at least inform people that GMOs are in their food, might be something worth doing, right? Might be something worth pursuing and something worth avoiding if I can. How long did it take us? to label things trans fat? We are behind the curve always. Yeah. Are lobbyists as strong as other countries? That's a great question. Yeah. Right? So I just want you, I wanted to throw this up here because I want you to think about it. Um, I'm not going to make any grand statements uh, about GMOs, but it is part of deciphering what's in our food, right? And figuring that out. Yeah, it, there's nothing on 
the nutrition label on the facts there, but it, it's important for us to think about. And I would like you all to think about it a little bit more now that you know all these other people in the world are thinking about it very seriously. If you haven't seen, seen Food Inc, you need to. Food Inc is a, it's a documentary, right? And it, it, well, it came out a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Very informative about this topic. So if you want to take a peek at that, that's a great idea. How long have you been eating this stuff? Decades. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, and we don't require labels on it, so it's hard to know what. Now, Dawn did give us some hints, right? Things that we can look at, at least with produce, to know. And there, are, there is a big movement towards getting away from GMO, so you'll see things labeled non-GMO, which is great, but that's not required. And, that, and that's what we would like to see. We would like to see uh, it be required if an item contains GMOs that they have to label that. So. Let's go through a couple. Yeah, we have a few minutes. We'll, we'll talk through a couple of these. We'll uh, decode a couple healthy foods for you guys and, and have a peek. Mm -hmm. So this is one that uh, Dawn told me about because she found this when she was looking for a good uh, road trip food for herself. Right. So this, I actually purchased this at Costco. Um, it's Campbell's Organic Garden Vegetable Soup, right? Organic vegetables. I was pretty excited. I can take this along to the hotel. I can warm it up in the crock pot. Yay, good. Threw it in the cart. Mm -hmm. We went on our trip. We ate it. I came home. There was an extra box. Took it to work and decided while I was eating my lunch, I'm going to read this a little more carefully and see what's in it. So where do we start? Let's start at the top. <gasps> Dawn, how much of this soup did you eat? I ate the whole box. Literally, the box is not very big. The box is mm -hmm. not very big, mm -hmm. but there's two servings in here. So mm -hmm. that's the first thing right. that we didn't realize right away that we might be getting double what's on here. Okay, so calories, 120, okay? But 20 of that is from fat. So not terrible, right? We're looking at calories versus calories from fat. 120 calories, not a huge deal if you're just eating one serving, but suddenly you're eating double that and it's a big deal. Total fat, two grams, aka four grams, right, if you're gonna eat the whole box, mm -hmm. which I would have. It looks like a single serving box. It would fill a normal size bowl. Mm -hmm. It's vegetable soup for Pete's sake. Uh, no trans fat, yay! No cholesterol, sodium. Ooh, it's a little bit on the high side. <laughs> Maybe not something to eat every day, right? 27%, right. doubled. 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 Fiber though, five grams of fiber, six grams of sugar, uh, right? Doubled, exactly. Not so much protein. Been, it would have been nice if they'd add a few more beans to their vegetable soup up mm -hmm. this protein, right? Mm -hmm. And then we don't look at this. That doesn't matter. Right. Now, so looking through the ingredient list, I was pretty happy for a while when I looked through it, and then I ran across a couple of things. Organic spice. Mm-hmm. Over here, flavoring. Hmm. I wonder what that is. Then I noticed my box didn't say it was gluten-free, and I thought, hmm, I wonder if this soup has gluten in it, labeled as spice or flavoring. Maybe. I don't know for sure but made me think. Um, I'm also looking here, there's molasses in my soup. When I make vegetable soup at home, I don't put molasses in my soup. Interesting there. Then the other one that really got me, I have to find it here, here we go, organic yeast extract. Mm-hmm. MSG, folks. MSG, hidden label. Mm-hmm, and wow. I went. And do you know all of the original uh, Campbell soups they all have the MSG they do. <coughs> in it. So, I mean, years ago, I just couldn't buy okay. any of those. And when I saw those at Costco, I didn't buy them because I knew the integrity of the, of, of the other Campbell's soup. So Agreed. I thought, you know what? I'm not going to mess with that. Agreed. But, but here, you felt this. Agreed. And you can easily see how you can fall into that trap, right? Yeah. Because you gave a double take. You thought about the Campbell's soup. But I thought I, about it too, but I, I thought. I thought not feeling good about when I. When I for sure. Discovered that all that bad stuff that they've been putting in there For and sure. mm -hmm, good, you know, to mm -hmm. serve your kids and everything. Mm -hmm. But 
mm -hmm. or your family and I thought, oh, no, nah, I'm not going to, yep. they've lost my me as yep. a customer. All good things to think about. So you talked about at the bottom, there's a little, um, in all caps and bold, it'll say, sure. Origins, dairy, milk, right. gluten. If they did use gluten in their spice or in their flavoring, are they required then to put gluten in that list or not because it's less than 2% or... Great Maybe, question. Is it possible that I'm looking for that, it doesn't say gluten, so I buy it and it does have gluten in it? Great question. What they would be required to put on there would be the word wheat. Now, there are things other than wheat that are gluten, so rye, barley, things like that. Um, so in that allergen list, it may only say wheat. So that doesn't necessarily mean it's gluten-free if they put something else in it. So if it has a different form of gluten, wheat's the only top allergen required. That, they would, that they're required to list. So then you still want to go back and read through each of those ingredients to know. In order for a label to say that it's gluten-free, it has to have less than 20 parts per million. So the barcode that starts with the number nine, and you described it earlier, it seems pretty good, but you must read this. And a, nine, a number nine might not be that good if it has some insulin. The barcodes that I was talking about earlier with the nine and the eight, those would refer only to produce. If you're oh, buying fresh produce. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it wouldn't be in any Correct. Category. Correct. Is that pretty common at like restaurants too? Like say I ask, like, oh, does this have gluten in it? And the waitress is like, oh, no, just barbecue sauce or whatever. Barbecue sauce is flavoring, could I potentially be eating gluten po then? Potentially, yes. Okay. So mm -hmm. unless I know exactly what they're using. Correct. In, and it becomes a, a, a don't panic, right? Yeah. We have to make the better choice sometimes, right? And do the best we can with what we have. Mm -hmm. And I would mm -hmm. say an informed eater would know the difference between wheat and gluten, but a lot of people assume if there's no wheat in it that it's gluten free. You know, and that's actually not true, as we just discussed, but sometimes that gets a little jumbly. Mm -hmm. And people, if you're not an informed eater, you're not going to necessarily know how to advise someone who needs to stay away from those things. The other thing to look for is oats because oats are actually contaminated with gluten. Correct. So Correct. What about restaurants that give you gluten and dairy free menus? Several not do that. They do. They do. Do you want to? <laughs> uh, so yes. Yeah. I mean, right? So taking a step back, we get really picky, right? We're, we are being really picky here. Mm -hmm. And like we said, Dawn had this, and this was a better choice than a lot of other items that she could have chosen. So if you are sensitive to gluten and you go to a restaurant that has a gluten-free menu, much better for you to choose off that menu than it would be for you to choose off the regular menu, right? And if, if we can even just get that close, that's a win, right? But what, we, what the, the thrust of this is, hey, let's look a little bit closer at some of these foods and actually dissect it a little bit. In your daily life, are you going to be dissecting or, or are you going to be able to do this 100%? No. Most of us will not be able to. But we, if we've got a good, better, and best choice, at least we can make the better choice. So. Good. So let's move on to the next one. You ready? Yeah. Anybody familiar with these? These are another Costco little yummy. Yeah? So true confession, I also bought these for a little road trip without fully investigating. They're called Aussie Bites. They look like these little mini muffins. Okay? So first I want to point out, you see this allergy information right here. This is what I was talking about that at the end of the ingredient list, we have this allergy in information and it says this one contains milk and coconut. Um, so again, that would be something, if those are things that you are sensitive to, you're gonna wanna investigate in that ingredient list what, what, where is the source of that. So I sort of, sort of breezed through this. I was in a big hurry, threw them in the cart, going on a road trip, these will be great, right? They're organic, looks like they're all healthy. And then as I'm sitting in the car and the family's eating these, I decided to look at the ingredient list. So here we have the oats. So I just want to key in on the point that you made here. Um, oats are not a gluten-containing grain. 
but very often they are processed on the same equipment as wheat. There's high cross-contamination rate. So for certain people, that can be a problem, right? If you are highly gluten sensitive, just something to be aware of when you're looking at, at labels and, and it's something that contains oats. Just be aware of that, especially if you have that high gluten sensitivity. But here's where this got me, right? So I start looking here, dried apricots. Okay, good, they're healthy, but they're a dried fruit, higher sugar content, so I'm gonna think about that. Number one, sweetener. Then we have organic sugar. Number two, sweetener. Then we have organic cane and invert sugar. Number three and four, sweetener. Then we have organic raisins. Number five, sweetener. And then I look down here a little farther and we have organic honey. Sweetener number six. And I went, oh. <laughs> yikes, no wonder they taste it so good. <laughs> mm -hmm. So again, you can see how I was being fast when I so bought these. I looked through it. grams of sugar did this have? Did you? We'll get there. We're going to oh, get there. You can, mm -hmm. you can go if you want. Yeah. Do it. So there we go. Eight grams of sugar but in there. But? Go to the start. One one. One of them. One. One. It's about this big and about that tall. <laughs> and it's really hard to eat just one. Yeah. Yeah. They're like a, a delicious cookie. They are. I think they we, are. I think we got those one spring break too. Mm -hmm. The same thing. Right. Right. So again, is this a better choice than some things? You bet. Much better ingredients than some other possibilities that we could have chosen. Um, it's a better choice. Is it the best choice? Is it something that we would want to eat every day? No. Once in a while as a treat? Probably okay. Yeah. Anything else you want to add to that? you got a lot of omega-3s in there. It does. So it has some things going for it, right? Oh, it certainly mm -hmm. does. And that's the tricky thing about this whole game, right? Figuring out, right? Apples and oranges, what are we looking at? Pros and cons, and then making an informed decision. If you just throw it in your cart because it looks healthy, that's not an informed decision. So that's really the goal, right? Is to, is to make sure that when you're looking at your labels, you are being an informed eater. Nope, nope, I was just saying you have to compare apples to oranges. It's a figure of speech. No. Okay, so again, at DBC, we always look at the whole picture. Uh, one thing I want to stress that Don said earlier, don't panic. Okay, don't leave here and go grocery shopping and cry in the aisles because you don't know what to buy because everything has something wrong with it. And that's not going to be helpful to you. But you can take this information now, right, and move forward and make informed, better decisions. And that's really what we're what we are hoping to give you is the ability to analyze the food that you're eating, um, to not be tricked by food claims, right? And, and to look at the whole picture, look at context, because that's what we try to do here at DBC with everything. So, next seminar, real quick before I take questions, we're gonna be talking about fitness. Okay, we're talking about functional integrative training. So switching gears a little bit. Again, here at DBC, we kind of cover the whole gamut of different topics. And it's time to talk about exercise. Summer is a good time to do that. So please come and join us on the 6th. It'll be the same time, same place. Probably different people up here. Uh, we like to mix it up. But um, yeah, get excited for uh, DBC Fit.